This show is my topic. Yes, it is. So Holland's super excited. We are talking about foster care and adoption and the stories we tell about those topics. And I'm excited too, because I know your stake in this goes pretty deep. Well, it does. In 2004, I adopted two children and the stories I told myself before I adopted versus the stories I've told myself in the last, what's it been, 15 and a half years? Those aren't the same stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, you adopted near the beginning of a major surge in adoptions in the U.S. And there was a time when foster care and adoption were hidden stories, and the people who participated in them were almost whispered about in public discussions. But things have really changed since that time. Oh, yeah. Uh, right after I adopted, there was a kind of a movement, I think, in the evangelical mm-hmm. church, at least. But I, th- I think there was a larger social movement uh, to welcome adoptions. For one thing, Um, Not only was the church becoming more aggressive about it, the gay community was also speaking up about adoption because uh, couples wanted to be able to adopt. And then that sort of brought a lot of non-traditional adoptions into the larger public conversation. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we were talking about transracial adoptions and international adoptions, older child adoptions, adoptions of children with disabilities, single parent adoptions. All these things became subjects of conversation, and it really changed story. It did. And these stories that we were told at that time were almost 100% positive, right, Holland? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, people who can adopt should adopt was kind of the message that came through in Hallmark films, such as Ellen Foster and books such as Kisses from Katie. But that's really just not the whole story. No, it's not. Mm. And there are all sorts of stories, beautiful ones, tragic ones, woven through adoption and foster care narratives. And we have some deeply experienced guests here to talk about that with us on the afterward tonight. Suzanne Woods-Fisher and Kelly Lewis. Welcome, y'all. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Boland. And you're listening to The Afterward, a conversation about the future of words. Suzanne is an award-winning, best-selling author of more than 30 books, including Mending Fences, as well as The Nantucket Legacy, Amish Beginnings, The Bishop's Family, and The Inn at Eagle Hill series, among other novels. She has become one of the top inspirational Amish fiction authors, with sales totaling over one million copies. The most recent one is called Stitches in Time, uh, and it tells the story of foster care and adoption in an Amish setting. Suzanne, welcome and tell us what you're up to these days. Well, thanks for inviting me along, and I appreciate this topic so much. In fact, I just have to back up a little bit because I was living in Hong Kong for four years in the 1990s, and that's where international adoption first kind of came on my radar, Mm. and a number of friends adopted. And then later in... Well, later, as I wrote this story about Stitches in Time, which is set in an Amish community, and and I can explain a little bit more about later, but I also have a daughter-in-law who's adopted. So this is a a topic very close to my heart. Wonderful. That's exciting. Well, Kelly Lewis works as a horticulture instructor at Spartanburg Community College. She is also a volunteer with her community and is regularly involved with events at her church and her children's school. Kelly has been married to her wonderful husband, Andrew, for 19 years. Did he pay you to have to say that? (laughs) No. (laughs) They have two teenage daughters, Aubrey and Avery. They have been foster parents for a year and a half. And so what's keeping you busy lately? Well, first, I want to say I'm not an expert. I am brand new to this field, (laughs) but I'm learning a lot, and I hope I can give you some some valuable input. Oh, excellent. We have been enjoying the beautiful weather for sure. It's been wonderful weather here. Been playing some tennis, getting a little exercise on the side to relieve Woo-hoo. some of the stress there of being a go. foster parent. And we just have a new placement in our family. So we have a new family member and we are getting to know him and he's getting to know us. And it's been an adventure. Yeah. And you have teenagers. Yeah. So, and that's the other thing. Yes. <laughs> Two teenage daughters. Yes. yes. So yes. it's, it's a handful sometimes. Well, we're glad that you're here. All right. Well, let's jump in. About a third of Americans say that they have thought about adopting a child, but only 2% have actually done so. Now, we know people are motivated by the stories they hear and tell. So what are the types of stories that motivate people to consider adoption or foster care? And what are the stories that cause them to back away from it, Kelly? Well, I have a kind of a neat story. Um, We had a little girl in our home for 15 months. She ended up being adopted with a family who adopted all of her siblings. So all four of them are in the same home, and she's doing very well. But one of my favorite stories about her is that she had never been to the beach before. And so we went on a family vacation. You know, she was so excited to get to the beach. She couldn't wait. She was just just chomping at the bit. 
And we get her down there, and she was 10 at the time. And she gets in the water, and she's lying on the beach, like, next in the surf. And she just lays out on her back, and she lets the waves, like, pour over her. And I'm thinking to myself, she's going to have sand in places that she doesn't even know she has. But she is just completely... I mean, enamored. She just loves it. She, We couldn't get her out of the water. Couldn't get her out of the water, put sunscreen on her. You know, we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't do anything. And to give someone that experience, mm, yeah. it was just wonderful. Wow. But, wow. And as far as the ones that kind of pushed them away, I mean, you hear all sorts of stories about, like, the cost of adoption and the stories about birth moms take, changing their minds. But to be honest, I think the way I tell my story, and I have to be careful who I tell it to sometimes— mm. Because some of the truth isn't very much fun sometimes. Got it's it. it's um it's difficult. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. that's a, those are some great insights. Yeah. Great yeah. insights. I love that. Yeah. What do you think, Suzanne? You're a novelist? Yeah, and I it's interesting. So I mentioned that I'd lived overseas and a couple of friends adopted children out of China at that point and we have become godparents for one of them and have stayed close in watching these families grow, especially repatriating and absorbing in the American culture and helping our child still feel as if their roots are real and, and they were chosen and, you know, trips back to China to show them where they, the orphanage, where they came from. So that's, I think, one of the most beautiful parts that I've seen. I think a lot of what makes people just go back on their heels is a lot of misinformation. Mm-hmm. As I was doing some research for this, I interviewed quite a few social workers and studied a, a lot about the statistics and then met with some families and I was surprised that I kept hearing over and over that for every bad story you hear on the news, there are two good stories that never get told. Mm. There's always the bad stories that that kind of make the news. And I think a lot of people sort of have assumptions of what foster care is, the age group, whether the birth mother returns, whether all, you know, what kind of support you have, the finances, on and on. But the truth of it is so appealing. For example, a, a child is usually in foster care less than two years. I mean, and then they're, you know, brought back with their, their biological family, and that's the goal. And, mm-hmm. you know, just a lot of little statistics like that. The average age of the child is seven, not a teenager, not a baby. Um, and just things like that. Anyway, I, I find that learning more about the real story and even talking to people like Kelly who's doing it is just the best way to see if this might be where you're getting called in your life in some way. Well, what caused you to personally become interested in foster care and adoption? So if I look at this book, Stitches in Time, and this is this is fictionalizing the whole thing. And so I, you know, right off the bat, let's get that straight. It's a story. But I read Amish newspapers, and there are such a thing. You know, the Amish are a little like the foster care, where the it's only the bad stories that make the news, but the, <laughs> <laughs> the real stories aren't getting told unless they're through some of their newspapers or you know the families well. And I kept finding stories about the foster care, and there's a group, for example, and they're actually Mennonites, which are like cousins to the Amish, Mm -hmm. that are near Philadelphia who actually go into a woman's prison, and they foster the children. They're not trying to convert them at all. You know, they're wearing their same clothing and going to schools and things like that, and they're not wearing the Mennonite garb, I mean. And they're working with their mothers, so that the mothers avoid, I'm going to say this word wrong, recidivism, they say it right, yes. you know, so they are not right back into the system. They're actually trying to help the parents become healthier and stronger and have a, a really a whole family. So that's what got me going and why I chose to kind of highlight it in this book. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. So for me, um, we have a, we do have a history of adoption in our family. Both of my husband's brother and his sister have each adopted internationally. So it's kind of been on the radar for us for a long time. When our daughters were younger, we kept thinking, well, you know, we have plenty of room. We've been blessed with all of these wonderful things <laughs> mm-hmm. that we could be sharing with someone that needs it. Um, but we were afraid, a little bit afraid, because our daughters were younger and we didn't want to expose them to things that... We didn't want them to be able to be unexposed to. That's not the right word. But (laughs) we really had it put on our hearts. I I believe that um, we were being called to -hmm. do this. Mm -hmm. So um, my husband actually had his job was going away. And so we were looking at the possibility of having to relocate to another state. So he had two options. He had these two jobs that he really thought he wanted to to have. One of them would be relocation. Mm -hmm. 
And the other one would be we, we would be able to stay in our home. And so, um, you know, we were praying about it a lot. And I kept getting these messages, okay, on the radio about foster care, about fostering. There's a family in our church that has five foster children. They're under the age of eight now, but at the time they were even younger. And I thought if they can do five, I can do one. Like, mm-hmm. make surely I could do one. Mm-hmm. But anyway, when, with my husband's job and his um, course of action, I, I started to stay, take some steps towards foster care. Mm-hmm. I decided, oh, well, I'll go to this meeting that they're having about yeah. interest, yeah. about the meeting. And we went to this meeting, and the next day my husband got an interview with the job that would keep us where we are. Wow, wow. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe we're getting some signs here that, you know, we need to keep going with this mm-hmm, right now. Mm-hmm, maybe this mm-hmm. is a good time. So we went ahead on the next step. We started filling out paperwork, and he got the job interview, and the job interview went really well, and he got the job offer. So we're able to stay where we are, and I felt like that was just some confirmation that we were doing the right thing. And then so many things have happened since then with um, our first foster daughter leaving and some other amazing stories. I don't know how much you want me to go into, but <laughs> it was um, a lot of things that I feel we, our family feels led to do it. So, um, and we feel like we're doing the right thing. So, and I love the idea of the calling. And then Suzanne, you shared about the misinformation. And when we do the research, um, sometimes that dispels some of the myths. I, I appreciate the the information because sometimes with information that it does dispel the fear, and then you can step into that calling a little bit more with your eyes open. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate that. Yeah. All right, Suzanne, so you wrote a book about Amish adults fostering Amish children. You shared a little bit about that just a minute ago. And, you know, Michael Landon Jr. made a movie about Amish adoption in which a family of Amish children was adopted by an English woman. And that kind of story can reinforce, and, you know, it's not just an adoption and foster care. We see it with missions and other things, but this idea of this outside savior complex. Um, But it can also encourage people to reach outside the walls of comfort that can find them and build beautiful families. So do you think the way in which we tell foster care and adoption stories matters? Well, I think it's it's good to be really honest about it and to kind of talk about the the hard part, the good part, the wonderful part, the ups, the downs. I, I think it especially I feel as if churches need to hear more about these stories and mm. how they can support and help a family like Kelly and her husband uh, with relief, with care, with some financial help, that kind of thing. And just to understand that people are doing the best they can. This child is a child of God, and there are so many opportunities to get involved. And we can talk a little bit more about this later, but it doesn't even always have to be so far as as having a child in your home. I have a friend who does um, the CASA, which is that you know wonderful court advocate system. Um, I have another friend who tutors children in that kind of a foster care setting. There's just so many ways to be a part of the story. And so, yes, I think telling the story over and over again is a really good message. That's why I love this podcast today and and just, you know, looking at it from a lot of different angles. Mm, that's great. Kelly, what about you? Do you think these stories matter? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times when I'm, there's been a situation where I think, oh my gosh, what do I do? Am I the only person, are we the only family going through this right now? Um, And so just just talking to other people, reading informational texts, I think we're afraid of what we don't know. Um, And Mm. so being able to get reaffirmation that you're not the only one out there and that there are other people going through it at the same time or have already gone through it and have great experiences to share with you. We have a friend, she's a few years ahead of us in this game. She's been doing this for a while. She was telling me about this little girl that she had. She had gotten the older sister and had her for a while, and the younger sister was in another home. DSS was kind of pushing her to try to get these two sisters back together. And so she was like, I'm not sure we can handle this other child. She had a little more, a few more issues. Mm -hmm. And she'd been through several foster homes, and they were like, we're desperate. She's she's going to go in a group home if you do Mm -hmm. not take this child. And so um, she ended up saying, okay, you know, we'll, we'll do this. Well, this child's way of trying to get back home was to be as terrible as she could be. She she thought if she was bad enough, she will go back home. Well, we've been we've got a new placement. We're kind of going through the same thing now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so having heard that story before, I thought, well, maybe we need to talk to him, like tell him, you can be as bad as you want, but she, unfortunately, that's not going to let you go home to your birth family. You'll end up going somewhere else, but is that what you really want? You yeah, know? Yeah. So, and he's seven. He doesn't know. But <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. But just hearing hearing other people 
and their experiences and sharing their experiences, mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference. It yeah. makes a world of difference. That's that validation and that mentoring, mm -hmm. you know, that there's that power of, I am not the only one. I'm not in isolation. I am in community mm -hmm. and having that support. And I, I wonder, Suzanne, too, some of your stories that you have as you're even writing these stories. And I, I appreciate the fact that you're talking about churches being honest and how churches can come alongside. I think that's just a, a great um, validation for the stories that you write, Suzanne, and the stories you tell, Kelly. And I just I appreciate that. Yeah. What kind of story would you tell someone who's considering adoption or foster care, particularly um, someone who's considering adopting outside their race or outside their country or outside their economic group? We've realized we don't even know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. So if you're kind of an expert with something, you at least kind of know what you don't know and what you need to find out, right? right? right. We don't even know that much. Like, um, <laughs> I'm thinking of a story, I don't know how this is going to come out, but we're a Caucasian family. We have a little African-American boy. And, you know, I do some reading on simple things like skin care and hair care. And, you know, I don't know everything, obviously. I find out some stuff. But we, my daughter was at a football game, and one of her friends, who's African-American, said, you need to comb his hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, we've we kind of been combing his hair. Like, I don't know what he's talking about. And so he's like, he needs this. And, you know, he, he was very open. And thankfully was willing to share with her so that, you know, he might not, the little, our little boy might not be embarrassed at school because we don't know how to take care of his hair. So he told her, you know, you need to get this by this, by this, by this. And if you can't figure it out, I'll come over and help you. Wow. And so, that's um, awesome. Anyway, but that, I mean, just little things like that. But also I've been doing some research too, because if he's going to be with us for a while, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, it's kind of a little island where we are, <laughs> you know, our, our circle of friends is not very diverse, unfortunately. And so, you know, finding some good mentors for him, because mm -hmm. we, we do know he's been exposed to some bad role models, to give him some positive role models that look like him. There are support groups out there for these sorts of things. So, yeah. and it's, this is new to us, so we haven't quite figured it all out yet. Sure. But um, anyway, I thought that was kind of a funny story. Well, and, and there was something you had shared earlier when we were just talking, Kelly, um, things to know, like, if you had if you had only known All right. a couple things, it, it would have been helpful as a foster care. So parent. we had um, our last placement was a little girl who was three years younger than my youngest daughter. And there was a lot of conflict there. I think they were too similar in age. Um, my daughter was the youngest child for 13 years. And now she has a little sister who's getting her daddy's attention. And and so um, we have this new placement who's a seven year old boy. Big age difference between my youngest and, and him. And um, it's a completely different situation. But I was telling our care coordinator about this. I was like, you know, it's so I can't believe because they kept telling my girls kept telling me it'll be different when we have a little boy mom. It'll be different. And I was like, why would it be any different? <laughs> um, but then we get this little boy and I, you know, and I'm telling our caseworker how much how mm -hmm. much different it is. And she said, well, you know, I wondered why you were asking for a little girl who was so close to your children's age. I just I had a feeling that wouldn't work out. And I was like, why would you not tell me this before? <laughs> like, because there was a we had an option, honestly, to have the brother or the sister. Not, not that we. I'm glad we made this decision. It was sure. God's decision to, to have go. him with, her with right. us. But that's right. at the same time, it was. But I know better now, and that's something I could share with someone. That would be a helpful thing to know. Absolutely, so, right? Someone yes, that's would. new, and yeah. Yeah. So. How about you, Suzanne? Anything that you would tell someone? Yeah, I was thinking of one thing, and I love Kelly's stories that are like right on the front lines. I think that finding out moms, talking to them, seeking them out. And Kelly, I have to laugh because I just think I have so many friends that if you don't ask just the right question, you don't get the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good example of where you just have to almost go to them and say, what should I know? What do I, know? What word do I need to know? But let's back up for a moment because if someone was going to really start exploring the idea of, of, let's say, even an international adoption, which is you know, quite a complicated story and yet a, a wonderful one. But I think one of the things I've found so interesting is that this is so scriptural. The Bible has some of the earliest documentation about foster care. It goes way back as a duty of the Israelites from the Lord. It's a reflection of God's character. The New Testament, in the book of James, they collected uh, money and redistributed it, aid for widows and orphans, which you could say today would be single moms and, and fatherless children and, you know, children in the foster care system. And there's more about just how the history of foster care developed. But I think to go back to that basic heart of it is that this is reflecting the heart of God so that you're going into this 
with that prayerful attitude and, and the sense that it's a calling. It doesn't mean that you have to say yes to it, but it's, it's sort of between you and the Lord, and it is such a good thing. I think that kind of gives you a little bit of empowerment as you carry forward, and as Kelly said, like step by step by step. Hmm. I think it explains it very well, and I think um, Kelly shared a little bit before we got started. Um, sometimes if you know too much, that could also be a danger because there was a book that um, she was talking about and said, oh, if you read this book, you're never going to do this. <laughs> and so while in some ways I do believe that having information is powerful, sometimes having too information, kind of what you were saying, Suzanne, we only hear the bad. And if we get too much of that information, then we aren't going to have our duty to care for orphans and be able to provide respite care in situations and giving that court advocacy and that validation. We won't do it because we've heard only the negative and we have too much information. And sometimes, I hate to say it, but ignorance is kind of bliss sometimes. We often won't go into something if we're that fearful. So I think you had some really good points. You know, I was thinking about how we tell these stories, and particularly because you're a novelist, Suzanne, I was thinking about novels that I've read that have adoption in them. You know, 100 plus years ago, there was Anne of Green Gables, right? Um, <laughs> actually, that's an interesting story. It's it, At first reading, you know, she's this wonderful, charming character who changes everyone around her. But also, if you go back and read it again, you can see that she had a lot of issues that were solved by being part of a family and a community. It, it may have been an, an offbeat kind of situation. But it really was a lot more realistic than sometimes people give it credit for. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was a kid, there would be these stories about, you know, some kid in the book would discover that they were adopted. They had never known until they were 10 or something, you know, that their mom and dad weren't their real parents. And I would think that would be cool, except that my mother was always very proud of the fact that she, like, basically just had me without having any kind of labor pain or anything. She just kind of <laughs> went to the hospital and... I was born before the doctor got there. So I'd heard that story so many times that I knew that no, nope. that was it. I was not, I was not going to find out that I had, you know, rich parents somewhere that had <laughs> relinquished me for adoption. But what's the essential piece of information we need to help us understand the role that stories, particularly fiction stories can play in foster care and adoption, Suzanne? Such a good question, um, and I think we kind of are covering it a little bit with just like finding out more and learning and taking one step at a time and and kind of, um, you know, really looking at, at what this is about. But I, I kind of go back to the whole idea that adoption is such a central part of our relationship with God. I mean, it is, it is a beautiful thing through Scripture over and over and over. To be adopted is to be chosen, and I, I like that. I like that feeling that you're moving into it with that that sense of trying to reflect the heart of God. Wow, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Kelly? I think it's important to have a feeling of not being alone, um, that there are other people out there. And kind of with foster care, you have to be very careful with what information you share with other people. You sign confidentiality agreements. And so you can't just have conversations with your neighbors. Right. You can't just have conversations with people you meet or that just meet your family. It has to be, you know, very restricted conversations. So the fact that you can go to literature to get some affirmation, to get some reassurance, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think is really important. And then when you can get with those people that you can talk to, the stories you tell, the, you know, the ones that other people that maybe outside of foster care could never imagine. And when you tell them they have these looks of horror on your face. But you can, you can definitely talk to someone else who's been there and the stories that you can share, you know, about whatever it happens to be. But, right, you know, right. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. That's excellent. Suzanne, I have a copy of your book at home, but all the invisible guests who are at our table may not have heard about it. So would you tell us about Stitches in Time? Yeah, thank you for asking. Stitches in Time is a story about a little town in Pennsylvania that actually all my stories are set there, so you have favorite characters that kind of come on and off screen. And this is a story of a young woman who has some kind of background that we're not really sure about till later in the book, but she is coming to this town as a school teacher for this little Amish schoolhouse, and she just has this sense of life is so fragile, and she wants to live it bravely, wholeheartedly. There's a new deacon in town, and when you're in the Amish church, you are a deacon for life. It is, it is not just a three-year rotation. It is the rest of your life is on top of your other job. Same with the ministers and the bishop and all. It's just the way that the churches are. They're, they're run by lay people that are chosen. And this deacon had this idea of emptying out the foster care system in Lancaster County, which is a huge thing. 
And it doesn't go that far, but it does go so far as a group home has black mold that's been found, and they need to immediately get these kids out of the house so that they can go in and fix the black mold. And so these Amish families, and I promise I did this all with accurate information. Some of them had already been licensed, so it was totally legit, as, you know, as close as I can get. But like I said, it's a novel. <laughs> but these families are taking in these teenagers from the group home. And the school teacher is one of the most enthusiastic of all. She just has dreams of pillow fights and slumber parties, and this is going to be so much fun. And there's so many different stories that are going on. Some of the kids are are an easy fit into a family, and some, like for this poor school teacher, ends up with two holy terrors who (laughs) sneak out in the night, and the cops are at the door, and... They end up um, accusing her of drug addiction when it's really her thyroid medicine and on and on. And so that's kind of a little bit of the story. Um, there's a, a horse trainer down the street, doesn't sound like an Amish novel, who is um, the little love interest for the school teacher. And the horses end up being kind of what pulls these kids back together. I actually interviewed some people about the use of horses with children who have some emotional issues and the ability that they have to actually control like the mouth of a horse through that bit and, and bridle and reins and the empowerment they get in having that connection to a horse was just part of their healing. So that's that's kind of part of, of the story. And anyway, I, I, it's hard to describe a novel, you know, in a, in a few words. I wish I were better at it. Librarians are so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Stitches in Time by Suzanne Woods Fisher. We can buy that where? You can buy it anywhere. You can buy it at Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, at um, ChristianBooks.com, at um, your favorite bookstore, and I think you'll enjoy it. It's got a lot of humor and real stuff, and and it's not what you'd expect of an Amish novel. Wonderful. Well, adoption and foster care stories can be funny, um, and they can be beautiful, but they are conceived in loss, and it's a loss that doesn't go away at what people think of as the end of the story. Mm. And how we talk about foster care and adoption can go a long way toward helping children find families and helping families prepare to welcome children who need families. So join us next week as we continue to talk with Kelly and Suzanne about how we tell stories about foster care and adoption and the effects our stories have on real life. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, rate us on iTunes, and become a subscriber to the AfterwardPodcast.com. Thank you for being at our table. <laughs>